go over your, our summer. Yep, so this is, this is going to be the first eight weeks that I have the basketball team, so they're going to come in in June. Uh, first thing I'm going to start with on page one is just talk a little bit about my system and what I can do for the basketball team. So I know that our basketball players are going to have weak neck extensors, and that being they're growing up so tall, they're towering over everyone, they're constantly looking down, so they're going to have weak necks. We also know that the smaller your neck is and the weaker your neck is, the more susceptible you are to concussions. So we're going to train the neck. That's going to be one of our pillars that we focus on. Uh, we know that basketball players are primarily going to have weak fingers. We know that because we're going to constantly see finger jams. You watch an NBA game, watch a college game, everyone's going to have the fingers taped. If you have uh, weak fingers, you'll be more susceptible to turnovers, um, more susceptible to finger jams. So we're going to focus on grip. We're going to focus on training the fingers as well. We know that they're going to have weak hamstrings. Um, we also know that hamstrings uh, are going to lead to ACL injuries if you have weak hamstrings. Hamstrings are going to lead to uh, hamstring strains, so we're going to train the posterior chain. Uh, we know that basketball players are going to have a weak VMO, that teardrop muscle in the front of the knee. That's going to stabilize the knee. If you have a weak VMO, uh, you're going to have chronic knee pain due to instability, so that's another pillar that we're going to focus on training. Uh, and we also know that basketball players are going to focus on their ankles. Primarily, their ankles are immobile. We really need mobile ankles in the sport of basketball. And if we have immobile ankles, that's going to lead to ankle sprains. And uh, lastly, basketball players' feet. They're big, they have real big feet, and they've really never taken care of their feet before. So one thing we need to work on is loosening up the fascia of the feet and uh, mobilizing and preventing injury by training the feet. Another huge part of this basketball program is deceleration and landing mechanics. We know that lack of strength is going to lead to poor body control, improper landing mechanics, uh, improper deceleration, and ultimately can lead to a serious injury or ACL injury. So the picture I have here, you see a person landing from a vertical jump. The first person, their knees are tracking out over their toes, that's good landing mechanics. The second person, their knees are caving in with a valgus knee. That causes a lot of sheer force on the knee and can uh, cause ACL injuries. Now if you just watch any basketball game on ESPN, you see someone jump up for a vertical jump, a lot of times you're gonna see someone land with that valgus knee. Um, and what is that caused by? Caused by lack of strength. So that's why we need to have a culture that's rooted in the weight room, teach athletes that base level of strength to prevent that valgus knee collapse to prevent injury. So here's just an overview of what this system is that we'll be implementing. It's a movement-based uh, system, not a muscle-based system. So we're gonna focus on a joint-by-joint -joint approach to training. And what that means is as your joints alternate up the body, they're gonna alternate between mobile joints and stable joints. So that's how we're gonna train. We know that our ankles need to be mobile. Uh, we need that for running, for cutting, for landing. If our ankles are immobile, we're gonna cause injury. So moving up to your knees, we need stability in the knee. We already talked about having a weak VMO, having a valgus knee collapse due to knee uh, instability, so we're gonna train our knees to be stable. Moving up to our hips, we need our hips to be mobile in three planes. Uh, that's you know essential for all sports. If our hips are immobile, uh, then our lumbar spine is gonna become mobile, and that's gonna be where we're creating injury. We don't want our lumbar spine to be creating injury because that's uh, not meant for that, and that needs to be stable. Moving up to our thoracic spine, we need our, our T-spine to be mobile. That's gonna prevent shoulder injury. Um, our scapula, our scaps need to be stable for any pressing movements or any overhead movements. And finally, we know that our shoulder needs to be mobile. If our shoulder is immobile, uh, just in our basketball stance, we're not gonna be able to cover as much ground. So looking at the program that we're gonna implement, there's nine primary movements that we're gonna train. Number one is the hip hinge, and we're gonna train the hip hinge because that's gonna be our uh, vertical jump position, our defensive stance position. Um, it's also gonna be training on the posterior chain. We talked about uh, basketball players having weak hamstrings leading to ACL injuries. We're gonna be training in a bilateral squat. That's gonna be our athletic stance, uh, and primarily that's gonna be our greatest exercise to increase force production for our vertical jump. Uh, training a full depth bilateral, bilateral squat is also gonna train our VMO and work on knee stability. We'll be training upper body push and upper body pull, and that goes without saying, we need our basketball players to be big, we need them to be strong. Basketball is a physical sport, it's a contact sport. We're gonna be training single leg, single leg hip and single leg knee. That's gonna we'll be training for balance. We're gonna be looking at um, imbalances in the body from the left and the right side. Um, and that's also gonna mimic our running patterns. So when we run, we have one hip that's in full extension and one that's in flexion, so we're gonna train that way. Uh, as I said, we're gonna be working on carries, loaded carries, and we're gonna, that's gonna work on our grip strength. 
So we want to train the athlete's grips. We want to get their um, their fingers stronger. So we're going to do that through a loaded carry. Uh, we're also going to train the core. Core is number one for me, and we're going to do that through bracing and preventing movement, working on anti-rotation. And that's going to be found through all these nine movements that I talked about. The biggest thing we're going to see is that we need our athletes to brace. Once they're able to brace properly, that's when we would progress to those loaded carries, because a loaded carry is essentially a loaded movement, moving plank. We're going to have our athletes brace, and they're going to uh, carry a weight for a prescribed distance. And last, we're going to train the neck. We already said they have weak neck extensors. We don't want them to um, get concussions. Basketball well is a collision sport, so we are going to train the neck. And just a quick overview here of uh, what an outline would look like for our performance pillars. Any you know, strength coach, Mike Robertson, talks about his seven R's. Well, here's just my version of it. We're going to be training tissue work to uh, prep for athletes. Next thing I'm going to do is we're going to focus on body alignment. That's going to be crucial for all the nine movement patterns that we talked about doing. From there, we're going to go into activation. That's activating the muscles for the movements that we're going to do. From there, we're going to go into CNS activation. Then we're going to do our normal resistance training program. Then we're going to do some kind of metabolic work and conditioning work. And last, an overlooked uh, piece that is very important to me is recovery. That's going to induce a parasympathetic uh, state in our athletes. So next page, you'll see um, a performance progress chart for our athletes. So this is going to show uh, everything that we're testing in the weight room. It's also going to have um, a, a GPA tracker, so we can keep track of uh, our total athlete as far as student athlete goes. We're also going to have before and after pictures for our athlete. What we're going to test in this program is going to come straight from the NBA Combine. So our metrics here, that's right from the NBA Combine. We're going to get their height, we're going to get their body fat, from their body fat uh, and weight, we can get their lean mass and their fat mass. Um, and we're also going to test their hand length, hand width, standing reach, and wingspan. We're going to get as much data on our athletes as we can. And this comes right from the NBA Combine. Uh, and so we're going to do that with our team. Combine testing, so now some performance markers. Uh, same thing, this comes right from the NBA Combine. We're going to do a, a lane agility test, a shuttle run, three-quarter court sprint, a standing vertical jump, and an approach vertical jump. In our weight room testing, we're going to test the hand clean for power. We're going to test uh, back squat and trap bar deadlift for lower body strength, bench press for upper body strength, and chin-ups for upper body strength. So now looking at a schedule, here's a sample summer schedule. So from what I understand, athletes are going to report first week of June, um, and uh, we're going to have them throughout the summer. The way this is set up is that to the left of the month, you're going to see what the emphasis is for each week. So when the athletes first report in June, the first thing we want to do is get anthropometric testing on them. Um, we want to get our combine testing on them. And those first two weeks are going to be GPP weeks. So we talk about the nine movement patterns that we're going to train. We want to solidify that and have a real strong foundation, teach them to brace, teach them to move properly for those two weeks before we do any weight room testing. The next three weeks after that would be a modified uh, performance cycle. So what we're going to do there is once we have a GPP week for two weeks teaching the athletes the movements, then they're going to go through a base loading week and a loading week before we finally test them in the weight room to get some data on them. Uh, the reason we're doing the weight room testing in week uh, five and not week one is number one is safety. We don't, I don't know where these athletes are at. I don't want to throw them in right away and uh, have them test. Number two is you know, the, the program wants to be performance based and you know, with that said, when we take our numbers, I don't, I don't care about the numbers as much as you know, other coaches might think. I, I want the numbers to serve a purpose. So if I'm programming all percentages, I want the percentages to be accurate. So if I'm testing in week one and getting percentages, by week four, those are going to be obsolete. Uh, we're going to have neurological strength gains, the athletes are going to adapt. So we're going to test them in week six where they have sound movement patterns, where they're familiar with the, uh, the, the testing exercises already, and where we're going to actually have more validity out of those testing numbers. Right now, I'm going off of a three-day-a-week total body lift, two days of movement. So three days of total body lifting, uh, two days of movement, one being a linear speed and conditioning day, the other being a lateral speed and conditioning day. What was given to me right now would be a Monday, Wednesday, Friday total body lift, a Tuesday linear speed and conditioning, and a Thursday lateral speed and conditioning. Um, if that does not work, there are, are we can obviously adapt. If we have a, if you want four days of lifting, 
Uh, we would lift an upper body day on Monday, lower body day on Tuesday, upper body day on Thursday, uh, lower body day on Friday, and then we would mix in our conditioning um, with our upper body lifts and our speed work with our lower body lifts. The three days, what I talked about, that's our primary one we're gonna focus on right now. And then if we have to do a two day, our split would be two, upper body, uh, two total body days uh, on a Tuesday and a Friday, and then a Monday, Thursday being our movement days. So looking at our warm up now for our GPP week. So now we're talking about the first two weeks here where we're introducing the movements to athletes. These are gonna be you know, our freshman athletes who have never lifted before, all the way to athletes that I've never seen lift. I don't know how uh, if they lift properly or not. So I wanna teach them my system and I really want to let, lay a strong foundation in these next two weeks as far as the warm-ups go, as far as the lifting goes, as far as the, the speed and conditioning go. I want everything to be ingrained to them and take our time to really teach them because you know, just as a basketball coach, you don't want to constantly be cueing and coaching the same thing four weeks after you taught them something. So I want to take our time and make sure we lay that foundation out in these next two weeks. So with our lifts, we're always going to start with activation number one. We're going to um, you know, primarily train one of those uh, nine movement patterns that we talked about. So in our activation, we're gonna have a hip hinge, we're gonna have a bilateral squat, a single leg movement. Everything that we're doing is gonna be to activate the uh, muscles that we're gonna be lifting for that lift. Then we're gonna go into core. And our core is gonna be an RKC plank, which that's our, our bracing plank. So that's a primary uh, movement pattern for us that we're gonna take the time to teach. With the RKC plank, we're working on body alignment, we're working on posterior pelvic tilt, tacking our ribs, and bracing, driving our elbows towards our toes, toes toward our elbows. Um, for those of you that don't know the RKC plank, research shows that you're gonna have more rectus abdominis activation, oblique activation, uh, and just overall core activation when doing an RKC plank. And to me, the RKC plank is fundamental for a squat, a hip hinge, a deadlift, any movement that we're doing. So we're gonna do that every single day, and so we're gonna really na um, nail that home for our athletes. From there, we know we need to train the ankles, we know we need to train the neck, we know we need to train the shoulders. Those are three things that need to be protected. So with our warm-ups, we're gonna always train our neck, we're gonna do something to protect the shoulders, we're gonna do something to loosen up the ankles or stretch out the tight calves that athletes have. You know, our basketball players are gonna be used to jumping a lot, they're gonna be used to a lot of plyometrics and not a lot of strength work or stretching. So that's one thing we're gonna work on is, is stretching their calves, mobilizing the ankles, and then really work on decelerating and eccentrically loading them. So the next page is our lift. So this is our two-week GPP phase. So as I said, everything we're doing here is just based off of uh, the movement patterns that we want to ingrain on our athletes. So really we're looking at just two main tiers and focusing on those two main tiers and then having a strength circuit at the end. So we're going to take our time and really teach uh, and day one, tier one, the kettlebell swing, teaching that hip hinge. We're going to go through a proper progression with that. Tier two, we're going to teach the squat. We're going to go through a proper progression with that, and then go into a strength circuit, uh, more for you know metabolic work, more hit training. Uh, day two, we're teaching the deadlift. We're teaching that um, you know for our, our hip hinge and pulling off the ground. Uh, tier two of day two, we're teaching our overhead progression. So we're going to start with the uh, single arm landmine half kneeling press. Day three, we're teaching our hand clean. So again, that's going to be our hip hinge pattern and tier two are teaching the bench press. So I really want to spend about 30 minutes or more on these first two tiers, instructing and ingraining these movement patterns with the athletes. So you'll see the progression here. With our kettlebell swing, we're going to start them with a, a waiter's bow, then we're going to go into our kettlebell swing. With our squat, we're going to do a body weight squat to a box, then we're going to do a rack squat, then we're going to go into a kettlebell goblet squat to a box. Our deadlift, we're going to teach from the rip toe progression to get them in proper body alignment. Um, for the hand clean, we're going to teach a pen lay one to one position. Um, that's why I love teaching the hand clean because that one to one from RDL progression is really going to teach the athletes how to hinge their hips and that athletic stance and uh, movement pattern is going to be fundamental through everything else that we do. Um, our sets and reps for our GPP phase is primarily just based off of five by five just for uh, getting athletes some volume and some exposure. Just some stimulus. They're coming off a, an off season where they haven't trained at all uh, after you know April and May. Now they're coming into the weight room for the first time in June. Um, and like I said, we're going to have athletes that have never trained before, and then most importantly, athletes that never trained with me. So I want to get them adapted to the system that I'm implementing. Flipping the page. 
Now we're looking at the summer one and two warm-up. So now our two-week GPP phase is over. Now we're looking at the warm-up that we're doing uh, for summer one and two. What we're going to add is tissue work. So now that uh, we're starting to increase volume, increase intensity, and possibly get some more on court work, we want to uh, make sure we're addressing the tissue as well. We're also going to work on body alignment. So that's fundamental for everything that we do, having a posterior pelvic tilt, tacked ribs, making sure the athletes know how to diaphragmatically breathe. So it only takes one minute to implement that, but the dividends are going to pay, you know, pay off in the long run. We're still going to have that activation piece, we're still going to have that core piece, and we're still going to protect the athlete with the ankle, neck, and shoulder piece. All we're adding is tissue work and uh, body alignment now. So going into the summer one program, so this is going to be our third week of training. As I said, this is a modified performance cycle. So we went through two weeks of teaching the athletes how to move through all the movement patterns uh, that we're going to have in the program. And now we're going to set them up for testing so we can actually get some numbers so that we can have you know, the before and after data on our athletes. Um, our modified performance cycle, we're going to have week one being our base week. So we're introducing these new exercises to them. Now we're uh, starting to load them. Week two, we're going to load even more, ramp up the intensity. And uh, week three is our performance testing, so that's where we're going to test our hand clean, our back squat, our deadlift, and our bench press. So we're going to have uh, baseline numbers here. These are going to be the fundamental movements of the program. The rest of our program is going to be based off percentages uh, from those numbers, and we're going to be able to retest later on in the summer to show the progress. Um, tier one, eventually, and now the first, the first six weeks here, so summer one and summer two, these first six weeks is still consider GPP and just base level strength. So like I said, when you have an athlete that, that's never lifted before, it's not gonna take a lot of stimulus uh, for them to adapt and you don't wanna throw too much stuff at them at once. So all we're really looking for is uh, strength, hypertrophy, and kind of you know a modified block periodization here. With that said, we are focused on strength and hypertrophy, but we are still addressing power. We still are addressing um, you know several different methods. So we're not, solely locked into one method of training. We are just emphasizing the strength and hypertrophy factor here for the athletes. The other big thing we want to focus on is um, eccentrically loading the athletes and focusing on deceleration. So um, you're going to see we have depth drops. We're going to focus on the landing mechanics of the athletes, um, which is going to be critical to transferring over to the court. Um, we're also going to be eccentrically loading the athlete with a kettlebell goblet squat to box. So we talked about um, reducing risk of injury, reducing ACL injuries, we're going to do that through eccentrically loading the athlete, something that they might not be familiar with when all they're doing is playing on the court and doing plyometrics and all concentric work. We're going to add different stimulus to start to protect our athletes. As I said, back squat, deadlift, and bench press are going to be um, our big strength movements we're testing in this modified performance cycle. Uh, we're kind of doing a modified 5-3-1 just to prep them for that performance week. Um, and with everything else, we're just hitting uh, volume, we're hitting uh, kind of a repeated effort method. Uh, as I said, farmer's carries are, are going to be at the bottom, plate pinch, we're, we're focusing on grip. All of our nine movements are going to be found in here, so three total body lifts. Going to summer two now. Now is where we're going to start to really progress our athletes and get into more of what the program is going to be like. So now we're going to look at a base week, so we're introducing new exercises, getting that base level of competency, and then we're going to load, and then unload two weeks. We're going to keep ramping up the intensity. As we saw on the calendar, uh, we only have, uh, I believe, 12 weeks with the athletes before they have off um, for a discretionary week. So we're trying to progress them through this strength and hypertrophy phase as quick as we can. You know, it's early in the off season, and then we'll get them closer to our preseason where we're focusing more on uh, the power and more what you might consider basketball specific. Um, with this, you can see we're progressing our military press to push press, but we've maintained our depth drops. And now our loading for our back squat, uh, trap bar deadlift, and bench press is going to be uh, sub-maximal loading uh, you know, to induce strength gains. So instead of ex uh, exposing them to you know, 85, 95%, uh, loads near maximal loads, trying to do strike gains. Everything's going to be sub maximally loaded, a lot of volume, getting them used to these movements because they're still new athletes. Now, this is still only uh, week five here. Um, so, we're still, getting, you know, they're not used to these movements. We want a lot of repetition, a lot of volume. So, that's what you'll see in our um, sets and reps for back squat, deadlift, and bench press. Um, you 
can just look through everything. Everything's going to progress. Our kettlebell goblet squat is progressing from an eccentric to now an isometric. So we went through a quick uh, eccentric phase, teaching them uh, how to properly lower their body, how to get everything firing. Now we're going to put a, a blue mini band around their knees, and now they're going to hit an isometric squat at the bottom for five seconds. The blue mini band is there so that they can forcefully drive their knees out. It's something kinesthetic for them to keep pressing against, teaching them proper knee tracking, um, teaching them proper squat pattern. Flipping now to speed and conditioning warm up. So our speed and conditioning days are going to be anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. And remember, there's going to be two. There's going to be a linear and a ladder, uh, linear and a conditioning day, and then a lateral and conditioning day. So starting this off, we're going to um, address all the movements as I talked about with joint by joint with a, a good dynamic warm up, trying to um, increase body temperature, get blood to the working muscles. From there, going into stationary activation. Uh, because the body is still going to be loaded, even though we're doing a movement day, we're still going to have to eccentrically load, isometrically load, change direction. So we want to make sure that we have good firing patterns, all the muscles with our stationary activation. Our GPP conditioning. So now we're back to looking at weeks one and two with GPP. As I said, week one, we're going to get our combine testing. All right, it's a little bit safer than going performance testing in week one. This will still give us good uh, performance indicators of where our athletes at and show our progression. And so like I said, we're doing combine testing out of vertical jump, lane agility, shuttle run, and three-quarter court sprint. The next three sessions for that two-week period are going to be a combo session uh, on that Thursday, and then a, a straight linear session and a straight lateral session. Just like you saw with the lifts, everything's a progression. We're teaching them uh, the foundation, how to do everything properly in those first two weeks. And that says the same thing with the movement here. So for our linear speed progression, we're starting them right on the ball, um, teaching them proper body alignment, posterior pelvic tilt, uh, teaching them the shin kick with the leg drive. So we want to make sure everything, the, the foundation is set. So at three weeks from now, four weeks from now, we're still not correcting these little things. Um, our linear progression, we're going to get them on the ball, then we're going to go into a resisted march and then a resisted run, and then it's going to be unresisted. Now they're going to go through falling starts, and then we're really going to focus more on our acceleration phase, so we're going to focus on the acceleration ladder. And our conditioning for this period is going to uh, go back and forth between tempo runs and the 300-yard shuttle. So we want to develop that aerobic base with our athletes. That's was more of a glycolytic sport, but it is long in duration, so we need that aerobic base for recovery. So um, we're going to do so through tempo runs. So if you look at week one, day two, tempo run, um, we have three sets, all right? In between each rep, or just for those of you that don't understand, the way we're setting up the tempo runs for basketball, one rep would be baseline, opposite end of the court, and back. So that'd be one rep. In between each rep to make it a tempo run, they're gonna walk the length of a court. So one rep would be sprint to the opposite court and back, walk the length of the court. The amount of time it takes them to walk is their recovery. As soon as they hit that end of the court, they're back into their second rep. All right, if uh, it's two reps instead of one, then obviously that's just double the length of the court. Um, in between uh, each set, instead of just walking one length of the court, they're walking the full length of the court and back. So we're trying to, to mimic uh, a basketball game a little bit and, and tweak different variables. 300-yard uh, shuttle, we're going to start out doing three 300-yard shuttles. The goal is to get everyone under 60 seconds, and uh, they're going to have three minutes rest to start. Um, looking at our lateral day, same thing as the linear, we're starting very basic and teaching them how to move. Obviously, basketball is a lot of lateral movement, a lot of shuffling, and yet there still is a lot of ACL injuries. So our goal is to teach them how to properly shuffle, how to properly move. So our uh, lateral progression is first just a step replace, and we're, we're teaching athletes how to work the inside edge of the foot and the outside edge of the foot, keeping their toes forward and having a proper weight shift. From that step replace, uh, then we're going to a push to move. So it's not a shuffle yet. A shuffle is a push and a pull. Now we're just doing a push, deceleration, push, deceleration, and finally progressing to a push and a pull. So again, focus on body alignment, like we've been talking about, um, to prevent injury. <clears throat> there we're going into change of direction, so Spider-Man deceleration. Obviously deceleration is often overlooked with basketball. They're not going to do that on their own. Yes, they do a lot of plyometrics on the court, but no, they're not, you know, they're doing all concentric work. They're not doing deceleration. So we're going to teach them how to decelerate laterally. 
from there go into a four cone drill and then our tempo runs. Um, if you're looking at where the times come for the tempo runs, uh, that is based off of Kansas women's basketball's 22 conditioning. Um, so other you know, collegiate programs have similar protocols. So flipping the page now, summer one conditioning. So we went through our two weeks of GPP, which you know, starts slow, teaches them the movement. Now we're going to pick it up a little bit. So now on our linear days, we're focusing on plyo prep. Still focus on acceleration into a free run and then conditioning. On our lateral days, uh, we're going to have that lateral movement piece, a change of direction piece. Then we're going to put it all together with a combo piece and then our tempo runs. Um, little variables change uh, for our plyo prep. Again, focus on deceleration, single leg, sticking, uh, learning how to handle your own body weight. Um, and with our tempo runs, we're going to keep progressing on that. 300 yard shuttle, we're going to increase our reps, and then we're eventually going to start decreasing our rest times. Flip the page now to summer two speed and conditioning. Our linear, instead of going plyo prep, now we're getting into some plyometric work. So we taught the athlete how to move properly, we taught them how to decelerate. Uh, now we're going to get them into some more concentric work, but still with the eccentric and isometric component, having them stick the movement pattern uh, just to ensure that they're doing everything correctly. Still have an acceleration and a free run component. Now uh, primarily focusing on hill sprints instead of uh, sled, sled work. And then free run now focusing on uh, flying 40s and uh, flying 60 drills. Our conditioning is now going to switch from tempo runs and 300 yard shuttle to a 60 yard shuttle, making it more game-like, and then into game speed conditioning, which is essentially uh, tempo work that's going to be mimicking what they're doing on the court. Um, for our lateral days, again, lateral plyos, so concentric work, but emphasizing that stick on the single leg, and then getting into um, cone drills with three cone wheel and T drill. If you flip the page, you'll see uh, game speed conditioning. So building off of the tempo work that we did in summer one, summer two's tempo work is game speed conditioning where um, athletes are going to be on the basketball court and they're going to be doing different movements that are, they're going to mimic in basketball with different durations and rest periods that they might mimic in a basketball game. So this is a very simple, very basic uh, sort of game speed conditioning. As we progress closer to the season, we're going to progress this uh, toward more of what type of offense or defense you are running. Uh, and make it even more drill specific and game specific. So overall, this is just six or eight weeks um, of an intro phase, foundational movements, teaching them strength. From there, we can start to progress um, and get into more uh, you know, basketball specific. You know, we're GPP right now, and we'll start to switch more into that sport specific motor training as the season goes.